You can be seated. I heard about this old country farmer. He was taking his just graduated from college son camping. And so they set up their tent and went to sleep. And in the middle of the night, the farmer woke up his son and said, look up and tell me what you see. The son said, well, I see a million stars. And the farmer said, well, what does that tell you? And he said, well, it tells me astro astronomically that uh, there's millions of galaxies in the sky. But in, in theology, it tells me that there's an infinite God that's great. And meteorologically, it tells me that t tomorrow's going to be a beautiful day. He said, Dad, what does it tell you? His dad said, it tells me somebody stole our tent. <laughs> Who's ready for the word? 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. We're going to leap right into this today because we started somewhere last week that we need to complete. And it says in verse 18, and we all, who's we all? That's all of us. With unveiled faces, there's no mask on your eyes. You can hear with your ears, you see with your eyes, and you understand with your hearts when you hear the word of God. There's no veil. We all, with unveiled faces, contemplate, meditate, think about, picture, revisit in our minds over and over, keep chewing on, we're contemplating the Lord's glory. We all, with unveiled faces, are thinking about, meditating upon. We are paying careful attention to the word that we heard, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1. The Lord's glory, Jesus winning. We're paying attention to when Jesus wins, overcomes, which is all the time. When you watch Jesus, he always wins. We're looking at how he wins, and when we look at how he wins and we pay attention to it and we contemplate it and we think about it, I like the word pay attention to because it means there's a cost. There's something you have to not look at so that you can look at Jesus. And it might be Netflix. It might be your TikTok feed. Come on, somebody. It might be something you have to, that you want to do that you're not going to look at because you want the transforming power of Christ working on the inside of you instead because TikTok is not changing your life. Somebody say amen. amen. And we all with unveiled faces are thinking about God's glory. We're thinking about when Jesus wins. And when we do, this is what happens. You're being transformed into his image, into the image of Christ. You are Christ in you. But how do you get Christ in you revealed in your everyday life? Because God wants you to live an overcoming life. He puts so much on the inside of you so that you would win. He marks out a race for you because he wants you to run it. And he wants you to win that race. And when you win, win, your, win your race, you're fixing your eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. You're paying attention to the word. How does the word relate to images? When you hear a story, your brain converts it to pictures. And so you're picturing a movie in your mind because we, well, this is what the human mind does. It hears, it translates what you're hearing into a picture. So we're seeing Jesus' glory when you hear the story about Jesus. When you read the word of God, because Jesus is the entire word of God. When you read the word of God and you contemplate Jesus' glory... You contemplate the word of God winning. That's Jesus' glory. The word of God winning. God's word wins in your life. It doesn't return void. It's working. When you contemplate that, then you begin to activate Jesus on the inside of you. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an automatic thing. You're being transformed into Jesus. Less of you, more of him. I am crucified in Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ that lives in me. As he was in this world, so am I. So when I, I, I say, Pastor, I can't go on another day. I'm done. I just can't, I just can't go on. But then you stop and, and lo stop looking at your problems and looking at the mountain and looking at the giant and, and looking at the storm and the negative. Stop it. And look at Jesus. Did he have to endure some things? And so when you look at your Savior and you go, well, he had to endure, and I begin to study his endurance amidst betrayal, amidst suffering, against people that don't like him, against abandonment, when I begin to see that Jesus endured many things, and he did it with a smile on his face and with confidence in his step, and he wasn't a victim in life, but he walked through life as an overcomer. When I look at the overcoming strength and endurance of Jesus, it gets revealed on the inside of me automatically and suddenly i've got the endurance to keep going on when i look at his forgiveness i look how he forgave people that wronged him it's up on the cross father forgive them they know not what they do and i contemplate that kind of glory that is not the kind of forgiveness that the world operates in 
but it's the kind of forgiveness that our Savior operates in, and he's in me, and that's the real me. I want to discover the real me. I got to discover the Jesus that's within me, and I got to peel off the layers of my unforgiveness and of my judgment and my offense and bitterness, and I have to peel off those layers and begin to allow the activated Jesus in me, and how do I do that? I watch him forgive, and I go, well, if he, that's how he does. He's in me. Then that's how I forgive, and it begins to activate in me that kind of forgiveness, and you know, Christ in you, this discussion that we have, a lot of churches and pastors avoid this discussion because it's just not popular. People don't want to hear about it. They think it's ooky spooky. It's weird. I don't know about that Christ in you stuff. Listen, Jesus wasn't ooky spooky or weird. Jesus didn't, the spirit of Christ didn't roll around in the grass being, you know, like a circus clown or something like that. Jesus was a man, he was confident, and he didn't stress out about things, right? You never see Jesus facing something like, I'm really stressed out today, I got a lot on my plate, everybody get off me. Jesus was never stressed out, he was never worried, he was never afraid, he was confident and courageous, and he marched through this world as an overcomer, and he won, he won time and time again. And so the Bible is saying, look at a guy who won in life and do what he did. And, and, and he does things that don't make sense to the world, but he's in us. And if we watch and contemplate his glory, we become those things automatically. And so this is what we started talking about last week. I had a 55 Chevy when I was a, a kid. This was my first car. The first car that I drove had a 350 in it. <laughs> Edelbrock headers. Four barrel carburetor, lifted manifold, coilers. This thing was a drag racing machine. You started and it had one gear. <laughs> only gear that worked was second gear. I bought this car for 1500 bucks and only had one gear, second gear, which limited it greatly because when you drove it, about 30 miles an hour is all you're going to get. A hot rod, one gear. When I finally got the gear switched out for, you know, I got, I got a Hirsch racing sh shift kit put installed into it. You, you shift the gears like this, first gear, second gear, third gear. It was amazing. It's a stick shift. It was so fast. And it could go 55 miles an hour now. It could, you know, it could go on the freeway. A lot of believers are walking around in your Christianity and you've got all this power on the inside of you. You've got a 350 with a four-barrel carburetor and headers and positive traction ready to come out and leap you into gear, but you keep running your race with second gear only. So many believers are not buying into what the Bible's teaching us about the power of Christ within you. Don't leave it. And so what's the key? Be transformed into that image. How? By hearing the word of God and contemplating it. The truth is, is we're going to face giants sometimes. We're going to face impossibility sometimes. I remember when my daughter was diagnosed as, as a, Katie was just a baby, and they said she's going to have breathing problems her whole life. Asthma and breathing treatments is her future. And Kelly and I rejected this, but the truth was, the fact was, is that she was on breathing treatments all the time. Albuterol treatments to keep her breathing. We were up at night watching her, putting her hands on her chest as a baby, checking her sleep, you know, discouraged, praying and believing God. We never accepted it as fact, though, even though the facts came and, and we had to do, for five years, we had to do breathing treatments on her. We were discouraged sometimes. There were moments where we wanted to give up and why isn't God healing her? But then we just stayed in our faith and kept saying, nope, God's going to heal her. This is temporary. And every time she got a breathing, breathing treatment, we would say, by the stripes of Jesus Christ, you are healed. We would confess that over and over and say, five years, why don't you give up, Pastor? We just didn't give up. Because what is giving up going to do? Why am I going to sign for this? After about five years, somewhere around the age of five, she stopped having breathing treatments. We didn't really even notice at first, but we just noticed that like when she's six, seven, it's been a couple years since she's been on this al albuterol. She's been doing really good. She ran cross country in her high school without any kind of asthma or breathing problems. So she's a singer, which requires a lot of lungs. What happened? We held on. But sometimes we're going to face things that we, fathers, dads, sometimes we're going to face things that are bigger than us. And we're going to need some Christ in us to get through them. We're going to need to start seeing Jesus work the impossible things. We're going to face storms that are too stormy. We're going to face mountains that are too big. 
We're going to face giants in this lifetime. There's going to be times when the doctors don't have an answer. There's going to be times when the financial outlook looks way too bleak. There's no way. There's going to be times when life is just too, it's just too troublesome waters. It's too deep. It's, it's too wide. It's too, too much fire. What are you going to do in those times? You've got to have someone you can lean on. This is what we're equipping you for today. And then a lot of churches and pastors are just going to stay away from a subject like this. And they're going to tell you things like, well, God is sovereign. And we don't know why he allows these things to happen in your life, but you just need to be okay with it. You know, God is a sovereign, powerful God, but, but we have a say by inviting him into our life. Jesus never said the phrase, well, God is sovereign. I don't know why you're blind, but you're just going to have to be blind because God is sovereign. And he chose, Jesus never did that. He prayed differently than, than people do. When I hear people pray and then I look at Jesus pray, it sounds light years apart. Because Jesus didn't pray that way. Jesus said, eyes open. He said, cripple man, get up and walk. He said, stretch out your arm. He, he spoke differently. He didn't say, dear God, if it's your will, I please hope that you might, if you just love me and look at me enough that for a moment that you could heal my... He didn't pray like that. He didn't pray these wimpy, victimy prayers. And I want a prayer life that works. Somebody say amen. And I've been given a Jesus that is a savior and an overcomer to watch him demonstrate. He came on to earth. He put skin on like me. He faced all the same crud I face and he won. And he put on a clinic for all of us to study and imagine and contemplate. How did he win? Because God is calling us all to win in life. My son Logan has a whole, his whole, own language. All my kids did have slang. You know, young people go through all kinds of slang. Remember the 90s slang? It's changed a lot nowadays. My son, uh, Christian, Matthew, and, and then my daughter, Katie, they used to include me in their language. They'd be like, oh, this is how we talk now, Dad. And they would, you know, explain it to me. And then I would jump into their world and talk like them. Logan is a Zoomer. That's what this generation is. He doesn't want to include his dad in how he talks. None of the Zoomers do. And so he'd be like, Mom, this spaghetti slaps. I don't know if that's good or bad. Did you just cut your mom down? I don't know what you just said. What did you just say to your mom? It's good, Dad. And I was like, oh, so the sp 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 spaghetti is dope? And he's like, no, not dope, slaps. And I'm like, okay. So then I go like, Kelly, your spaghetti slaps. And then, then Logan looks at me and he's like, no, Boomer. <laughs> boomer? To a Zoomer, everybody over the age of 25 is a boomer. I am not a boomer. I love boomers. I look up to boomers, but I'm a Gen X. Gen X. Where's my Gen Xers at? We love our 80s, amen? And we hate coconut, right? Okay, so, and country music. Okay, anyways. So uh, let's ask Ted, though. Ted, I want you to reword Acts chapter 3, verses 3 through 6 in Zoomer language. Let's see what Ted does with this. This one guy, lame from birth, was posted at the temple gate called Beautiful, and he was low-key begging. He peeped Peter and John about to bounce. He was all asking for them to hook him up with some. They were vibing, so they peeped him back. Peter was like, sorry, Stan. Stan, what, where do we get Stan from? Sorry, Stan. You think we bougie, but we got no guap. But what we do got slaps, no cap, it's bussin'. Stan, you about to glow up in the name of Jesus Christ, the goat. Rise up and start walking. <laughs> That's how their Bible's going to have to sound if they want to understand it. And so, so it's so easy to misunderstand and misinterpret things, though, in life, isn't it? And so I want to talk to you about misunderstanding the Word of God a little bit today. And we're kind of in this mode of transforming into the image of Christ, so we've got to get the image right. Jesus is all of the Word of God. Let me make sure I make that clear. He's all of it, and he's in all of it. He is the Word. And so we see this story where Peter's walking in the kind of power that we're called to walk in, to be an overcomer, and, and maybe not always just lifting somebody up out of the, off the ground, but maybe lifting a coworker out of their depression. Maybe turn around and lifting a neighbor up out of their pit. People are hurting. People are down. And so Peter shows us how Jesus is a need meter. Jesus is in, Christ, in, in Peter having expression through his hands and feet right now because Jesus went around meeting needs. Peter is now walking around meeting needs. He sees a need and he meets it. He gets this man up by the hand. This man is completely healed. 
He begins to jump around all over the place, leaping, and the people knew him. They're like, we know this guy. We've seen him for years. And, and now he's walking and leaping and praising God. They're, they're in awe of this miracle that just happened. What just happened? And so they, they're looking at Peter like he's some sort of significant like legend of some like, wow, this Peter. And this is what Peter says. Listen to Peter, Acts chapter 3 and verse 12. Now we can get a lot of insight from this if we take our time. When Peter saw this, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us? Where are they supposed to be looking? Christ, right? That's where Peter's looking. He's got his eyes fixed on Christ. Why, does this, why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? Look, it's not because I'm a good person. It's not because I'm powerful. Then he says this. Next, next uh, let's continue on. Verse 16, by faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see now was made strong. So he's telling us how it happened. It was faith in the name of Jesus that this man was made strong. It's, then he, he breaks it down a little further. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him. See, Jesus in you has faith too. You have mustard seed faith, but he's got great faith. Somebody say amen. Amen. And you put the little mustard seed faith in him and then let his faith come out. His faith will believe for the miracle where your faith is weak. Does that make sense? It's him operating through you. It's not your great faith. It's his great faith. It's, that's what Peter's saying. He's like, it's his name and the faith that comes through him that completely healed him, as you all can see. In other words, what you just saw was Jesus, not me. That's what Peter said. He's like, as he is in this world, so am I. He's walking out. Jesus in miraculous power in his life. It's not, not me, it's Jesus. And you can move like this through life too. Being a need meter. Seeing needs happening at your work. Seeing needs happening in your neighborhoods. Seeing needs happening as you're about through life. Seeing people that are down, that's a need. Seeing people that have need of money, that's a need. Seeing people that are hurting, that's a need. Broken hearts, abandoned, abused. This world, you can't travel far without seeing people's needs. And we're called to be need meters. But how do you do it? How am I going to need it? What can I do? Exactly. That's the great question. What you can do is nothing. Not by your own power or your own godliness can you do jack. But because of Christ in you, you can meet every need. Because he's full of riches and he's full of glory. And he's crowned you with glory. Praise God. And so I think Peter's been meditating on this phrase that Jesus spoke in John chapter 14. I think he's been contemplating the Lord's glory in this passage because I want you to see that what he just did and said echoes perfectly what Jesus spoke to the disciples right before he went to be crucified. And this is what Jesus said. He said, do you, be not, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? I'm in John chapter 14, verse 10. The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Right? He's like, you're looking at me, but I'm saying, look at the Father. This is what Peter just did. He's saying, you're looking at me, but I'm saying, look at Jesus. So he's imitating Christ now in this. Do you not believe that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me? Isn't that exactly what Jesus is for us? He's in us and we're in him. The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the work. The God is doing the work. For us, it is Jesus that is doing the work. Now listen to how he says this. Believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works I do, he will do also. So that's for us, because I believe. Say, I believe. Okay, this scripture is for you. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, this is what Peter did in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth is what he said to that, that man at the gate called Beautiful. He used the name of Jesus and he, and he brought in the, the word Nazareth as the guy that would lived here. And the name of Jesus of Nazareth, is he, he's just a dude. When you say of Nazareth, it's like saying Jason Anderson of Gilbert, Arizona. And you go, oh, he's just a regular guy that lives among us. He's like, yeah, it's Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that guy, by his name. Because why? Because that's the name that is above every name. 
He says, whatever you ask in my name, Jesus says this, that I will do. What is he saying that to you? Whatever you ask in the name of Jesus, whatever, what does whatever mean? Whatever means whatever. Now, it's got to be obviously according to God's will. He wouldn't ask. It has to be something that's in his name. Whatever you ask in his name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Give the Lord some praise right there because God is moving on your behalf. Here's the problem. People misunderstand the Bible all the time. Think about all the different doctrines and theologies. Open up your TikTok for like two minutes and listen to your social media pastor. And he's going to tell you stuff that's not, not true. They're going to take the word of God and make it funky. And, and people make the word of God funky all the time. But people missing the Pharisees knew the word of God in Jesus' day. The Pharisees knew it better than anybody. They knew it better than we do. They knew the Old Testament better than we do. And they loved God. And they were there living their life to serve God. They loved God, they served God, and they knew the Bible. But they were wrong. Is it possible to love God, serve God, know the Bible, and be wrong? Yes, it is possible. So we need to be careful of this trap because we are people that love God and want to serve God. We don't want to get the Bible wrong. Somebody say, man, Saul got the Bible wrong. He was persecuting and killing Christians, and Jesus had to visit him and say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Because why? Because he loved God. He, was, he knew the Bible really, really well, but he was wrong. The entire church of Galatia got a letter from Paul because they were wrong. The whole church was wrong about the doctrine they were slipping into. How can a whole church be wrong? They are. There are tons of churches that are just completely wrong about doctrine and about theology. That's why there's so many different doctrines and theologies out there. And a misunderstanding of the word of God is powerful. It's what Satan works so hard at. If he can get you to misunderstand the word of God, he can get the power out of you. Misunderstanding sank the Titanic. What do I mean? They had heard that it was an unsinkable ship, so they're sailing too close to... They weren't even afraid of icebergs. And they had only put 16 lifeboats on, the, on a boat that could hold 64 lifeboats. Why? Because they, they believed it was an unsinkable ship. And that misunderstanding cost a lot of people a lot of lives. And I believe that there are Christians who are sinking in life not because they don't love God, not because they don't know the Bible, but because they misunderstand the Bible. And I can give you one simple key today that will keep you from ever missing under, misunderstanding the Bible again. You want that key? You're like, I want that key. Okay, let's do it. Second Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 14 through 18. This is the same passage where we're going to contemplate the Lord's glory, but we're just kind of going up a couple verses. But their minds were made dull. Remember Jesus talked about people who were hearing him speak, but their eyes could not see, their ears could not hear, and their hearts could not understand. He, he called the Pharisees blind guides. They were hearing the same word of God that we get to hear. But they were missing it. They, they, they didn't get it. And so he talks about their, their minds can be made dull. And then he tells us why. For to this day, the same veil remi remains when the old covenant is read. When I hear the old covenant, a veil has power now. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to the, I, don't jump ahead of me. I'm getting somewhere. Even to this day when Moses, the old covenant, is read, a veil covers their hearts. Even to this day, this is still happening today to people. But whenever, here's the key, anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. So when you inject Jesus suddenly into the passage, so I still read the Old Covenant all the time. I read it out loud. I share with it. I teach, I teach from it sometimes. But I always pull Jesus in to make sure that we're relating to how it's different from the New Covenant now. Because it is a different covenant, and you don't live under the Old Covenant. The Old, co old Covenant came with a curse. The New Covenant does not come with a curse. The New Covenant is better, but a lot of times Jesus said they're going to prefer the Old and so people, a lot of people prefer the old. We call this ear tickling. They want to hear the old. They want to hear the justice of God. They want to hear about the wrath of God. And we want the rules. Okay, I'm a Christian. Tell me what the rules are so that I don't sin. We're a very sin conscious human race. This is what we do. I want the rules. This is ear tickling. Tell me what's wrong and tell me why that person's such a sinner. And I want to know why that person's such a sinner. And I, and I want to be judgmental. 
It's fun to be judgmental. It's, it makes you smile. It's the old covenant. So we're going to talk about this for a second now. Let's keep reading. But whenever anyone turns to the, to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. So when I get it right, I'm, I'm activated in Christ. How do I get it right? I have to inject Jesus. I have to see Jesus everywhere. When I'm reading the word of God, I have to go to Jesus and, and remember the cross and the finished works of the cross. Let me ask you a question. If you were to face eternity today, would, do you know what eternity looks like for you? And would you have peace with Father God? Here's the good news. God has already offered the free gift of eternal life to anyone who will believe. You might say, believe what? Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for sin and rose from the dead. Make him the Lord of your life today. And you can know where you're going to be when you die, before you walk out those doors, you can know you'll be in the kingdom of heaven with Father God. Just repeat this prayer after me, and maybe you've been away from the Lord for a little while. Rededicate your life to the Lord today with this prayer. Dear Father God, forgive me of all my sin. And Jesus, I believe in you. You're the Son of God who died for sin and rose from the dead. Be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name. Amen.